Good evening, everybody. Welcome back to Horse Center with Swiss Army Sean and our guest this evening, Jockey Romero Mirage. How are you tonight, Romero? All good, all good. How are you guys? Glad to um, be here. No, no, we're we're glad that you can make it. We appreciate it. The pleasure is all ours. So you're hanging out in South Florida. And before we came live, you had mentioned you grew up about 10 miles away from where you work now. So how cool is it to grow up in South Florida, have a dream, and then have that dream come true in South Florida? Oh, it's a, it's an amazing feeling. You know, it's like I'm living my dream right in my backyard. All of my friends from high school that I used to play soccer with, they always come out to golf shoe and watch me ride and show me a lot of love and support. Hmm. So you played soccer in high school. Now you said, I read, that you got into soccer because you were getting a little chunky. <laughs> Tell yeah. us about that. So when I was like eight years old, my mom said, you, you, you need to sign up for some sports. You need to do something. So I got into soccer. I started playing um, recreational soccer at eight years old. And then when I turned around 12, 13 is when I really started getting serious playing for travel, pr travel teams and club teams across um, Florida. And I played a little bit of high school, but um, I didn't play too much of high school just because of um, you, you get scouted more if you played for academies and club teams rather than high school. So our clubs and academies would a lot of times restrict us from playing high school. So I didn't play too much high school. I played a little bit, but uh, mostly club and academy. Yeah, I'm familiar with the club and not the academy. My son didn't make the academy team, but we did like the uh, the not the local club team but like the regional club team stuff so we'd be around ohio because we're in chicago pennsylvania indiana cincinnati up and so i did i'm familiar with that travel spot stuff so it's uh i saw some of your dribbling skills on on uh on your tiktok account so have, have you there used to be a show on goal tv where they had the guys doing the trick stuff what kind of tricks you got in your bag um i have a couple or i, I used to have a little bit more tricks that day where i was just juggling i haven't touched the ball in a, in a little while and uh, soccer will always be a part of me so sometimes i'll go out kick the ball around you know i'll mess around with a couple of my friends play a little pickup game because i soccer is always a part of me I, I i love it and it's one of my passions as well now i saw you coming in from working out outside and i thought to myself okay it's miami my man's got a winter hood on hat on and i didn't think about it i'm like you know what those folks down in florida are really something first day it's 50 down there they act like up here when it's minus 30 i didn't realize <laughs> that you were just working out to keep yourself you know fit and ready to go so how much time do you spend a day making sure you stay on weight and how helpful is it to live in a warmer climate to make it happen um it's it's pretty helpful but it's um i, I spend about an hour hour and a half every day and make sure that I keep my weight down and working out outside and inside. It's honestly, when I was in New York, I had the gym, so it didn't really make too much of a difference. But the reason why I like running outside is because I have a, a NFT app that tracks my, my, my running and it literally it's a, it's a move to earn app. So you kind of move, you, you move and you earn tokens. So it's something that I got into, which is I integrate that into my running outside. So I run for 10, 15 minutes outside. I go inside on the stationary bike for about 30 minutes. And that's so I keep fit and keep and, and maintain my weight. So is that so that you can buy NFTs? But I because I know that you started something called the Jockey Experience. Is, are they related or they're not related? No, those two are two different entities. Uh, Step in is the move to earn app and it's backed by Binance and Adidas, which is why I, um, I, I, I like them so much. You know, it has great backings and it's a move to earn app where when you move, it, it gives you, when you start off with your first NFT sneaker, you get to run 10 minutes out of each day and you earn a amount, a specific amount of GST, which is the, the cryptocurrency within that app. And you could transfer to Solana or USD, USDC, sorry. Okay. So tell us a little bit about your jockey experience. So that project is. Uh, we're planning to launch in the beginning to middle of September. And what that project, the main point of that project is to really bridge the, the world of horse racing into the world of red, Web3 and vice versa, bridge Web3 into horse racing. Because there are two complete different worlds where, you know, a lot of people in horse racing, they do not know about Web3 and people in Web3 don't know too much about horse racing. But they, sh they, they share the same the, the same problem in which... If you look at the media, there's a lot of bad rep 
about horse racing. There's a, bad, a lot of bad rep about Web3 and NFTs and cryptocurrency saying it's a scam and stuff. And as you know, in, in every aspect, there's always going to be a bad apple that may spoil the bunch. But if you do your due dil- diligence in the NFT market and cryptocurrency, you, it's, it's obvious which um, projects are scams or, or, or rugs. And in horse racing, it's a lot of times I see in the media where people say horse racing is abusive, it's this and it's that. But then when they check it out, the crop, you know, it's very nervous. It doesn't hurt the horses. And on top of that, we have many um, whip rip, uh, sorry, crop reg- regulations where we can get fined or suspended just because of that. Mm. So, so the, the point of the NFT is just to educate. That, that's the main, that's the overall goal of the NFT. So I, you talk about the, the folks in horse racing. Yesterday, we had on um, Farron Peterson. And she's also a veterinarian. And she was talking about how the horses on site have masseuse, they have chiropractors, they have nutritionists, <laughs> they get massages, they get baths. I was thinking to myself, you know what? If there's reincarnation, if I don't come back as a person, I want to come back as a, as a racehorse because I'd love to have a masseuse on 24-7. So at your jockey experience, you asked for a vote. You can see that over the jockey experience NFT over on Twitter. There's four of them there. I got to say the two on the bottom are my favorites. What if, you know? Where do you come in, Sean? Uh, yeah, I'd say the one, the, the bottom um, on my side. It's the bottom left. The, the blue, the one. blue one there with the yeah, yeah. How about you, Romero? Which one do you, uh, which one do you uh, prefer? I love the one with the portal because I feel like it's it's a horse coming from off the pace, just nailing everybody on the wire. That's what it looks like. A horse coming from the clouds. That, now, do that, you design that, these, or do you have somebody do it that no. does it for you? We have a graphic designer. Our food, our, our team is fully doxxed. We have a team of 12 people that controls. Our team is broken up to different sections. We have an IRL and charity department, IRL department, which is in real life events that they plan the events. We have a charity department where they reach out to charities, which we're going to be donating to when the project starts, like the PDJF and the Thurbit Aftercare. We have our Discord group, which handles our Discord, making sure that we don't get hacked, make sure, making sure that everything is safe and Everything within the community is going very well. And we have a graphic designer, which is Jasmine. And then we have myself and Al, which are the project leads, and I'm the co-founder as well. So you're doing a lot of things. Sean, what do you say? Well, Romero, you started in 2018, and you had a successful start. You won 75 races your first year. And in 2019, your first month, you again, you had 10 wins that first month, 135 mounts, and then you had a serious injury. One quick thing. As far as fast starts, you really didn't have a fast start. Your first race, the horse flipped over on you, right? Well, Tell us about that. <laughs> no, I, I actually got lucky he didn't flip over on me. It was it was a crazy day because that day was my 18th birthday. I've been working horses for the last eight months, getting ready. And in Gulfstream, it's a regulation that you have to be 18 years old before you ride your first race. So April 14th was my birthday, my 18th birthday. And I told my uncle that that's when I'm, I'm going to start riding because I was ready to go. So he said, okay, I'm going to name you on a horse. He names me on the horse. I'm walking out into the paddock, and everybody looks, and they're saying to me, oh, your horse got scratched. I'm like, okay, yeah, that's BS. I know you guys are messing with me. So I walk out into the ring, and I see that my horse is actually scratched. So that was just, it, it was funny. They, the horse flipped over while they were saddling him. I guess he got spooked by something. And then the next day I was on, I was named on a mount, and that's when I had my, my first ride on April 15, 2018. Mm. All right. So Sorry actually, to interrupt you, Sean. No, then we'll we'll actually backtrack too because you brought it up. Your family, there's a lot of family that's into horse racing. Talk a little bit about your family in horse racing and how they uh, pretty much contributed to you getting a start in horse racing. Yeah, um, I, I would like to say you know it's because of them why I got into horse racing. I was basically born into it, you know, where my my uncle, my cousins, they were um, always. Um, buying me toy, toy horses growing up. And then my cousin, Rajiv, um, he he helped me riding, help learning how to ride, especially when um, when I started to gallop, I went to New York. I stayed with him for a little bit. And he, he taught me a lot on the equisizer. And then while I was riding as well, once I started my riding career, he, he was a great mentor where I could call him for advice about races. But I was really born into the sport. All of my family members that are in the sport they really have always pushed me saying you know you should try to lose weight become a jockey you know it's really instilled in you especially when the doctor told me that i wasn't going to grow past five four 
So that's when I was like, yeah, I should be a jockey. But at the time, I was getting scouted. So it was like a like a decision I had to make at 16. Yeah. What's his name? Uh, the, the guy from uh, Argentina was 5'4", right? Uh, Maradona. Yeah, he was really short. <laughs> did, you ever think, did you ever think of starting somewhere else since golf stream you had to wait till you were 18? No, uh, I never I never thought of um, starting somewhere else just because of I, I was only galloping for eight eight months at the time because I, I literally was shed rowing horses up until July of 2017. And that's when I started galloping. That's when I really started getting on horses, jogging, galloping horses. So eight months was honestly a short period of time to be galloping, working horses to start riding. So it, it didn't cross my mind to start anywhere else. Like Gulfstream is where I always wanted to start. Okay. And in 2019, as I alluded to before, with the serious injury, talk about that day and talk about how painful that was to sit around for a year before you got to ride again. Um, so it was it was really devastating at the time because I started off the year rolling. I I was doing very good in that championship meet. It was it was a lot better than I expected. My agent at the time was Walter Blum, and he told me because I was going to go to New York that winter of 2018, 2019. I was going to go to New York, and he told me to stay in Florida, and we're going to find some good horses, and we're going to be. He told me that he think we'd be top five in the champions meet championship meet standings, which. For me, we were top five. I was fourth in the standings when I fell. I was named on the the weekend I fell. It was about a couple of days after I went on maximum security, his second start. I fell on Thursday, January 31st, and February 2nd on the Saturday. I was named on a bit special in a grade two, which were eight to five, and she galloped in that grade two. She actually beat Regal Glory in that race. So that's how nice of a filly she was. You know, I, everything was really starting to come around. and. It wasn't. It wasn't the injury that hurt it so much more than just watching all of these horses win. <laughs> to be honest with you, because after I did surgery, my my surgeon did a phenomenal job. Um, my back didn't. I didn't have any pain in my back, which was really a blessing. I, I must say, he did a phenomenal job. It was just watching these horses win. But um, actually, thanks to my cousin Rajiv, he he helped me with the mental part of it because he's been through a lot of injuries and saw a lot of his nice horses win with him being in the hospital. And it was just something as a jockey, you have to, you can't change it. You know, it's out of your power that you got hurt and you have to be out. So it's either you, you move on and you learn from it, or you just, you know, kind of dwell on it. And I chose to, you know, just move on from it, learn and take everything with a grain of salt and just try to progress myself and work towards getting back to riding and getting stronger for when I come back. How does it feel to ride a horse like maximum security since 98% of us will never get an opportunity to do such a thing? It was um the first time I went on him. It was like I was like wow, it, he was a really nice horse. And then the second time, I remember the race like it was yesterday. The whole time I was just sitting loaded, just waiting to just make my move because there was a couple speeds in the race that I let go on the opposite hand. And first time out when I broke, we're just in front, and he won by about 15 lengths. And then the next time, the second time when I went on him, I broke. I let the speed go, and then we just circled them, and then we opened up by eight lengths, and we went like. 109 in the slop at Gulfstream for uh, a nice three-year-old. So that was it's it's just um like driving a Ferrari, I must say. Yeah, <laughs> well, yeah, I hear jockeys say that all the time too, of knowing what you have under you or knowing you don't have anything. What does that? What's the difference? Like, how do you feel that? Um, you can just feel it just by their engagement, and the thing about it is that even sometimes, if sometimes horses are lazy. And you have to ride to get it out of them. You just have to ride them to, to really get it out of them. And if, you, you can really feel it because they'll take you up into a nice position. And some horses, you'll have to really ride and urge them to keep that position or to, to further themselves in the race and, and make up ground. So that's one of the biggest things that we can, um, we can, we can feel, oh, especially when you're an experienced rider as well. When do you know, like when you're on a horse, are you like, man, I, this one is legit? Um, you mean in the race or like in the post parade? Uh, just like, like say you're on a horse for the first time, like a maximum security or some horse like that. And you've ridden, you know, thousands of horses. So there's got to be a point where you're on a horse at some point in the race where you've never ridden one before. And you're like, this one's special. Yeah. Um, I think I can just tell from the post parade, to be honest with you. I remember when I rode Diamond Wild first time out, she's never run before. She's a two-year-old. 
and it's it's early August. You know, sometimes two year olds are a little bit skittish where they look and you know they're a little bit um, curious about everything. I took her away from the pony, and it's like she's been at Gulfstream every day. And keep in mind, she's stabled in Palm Meadows, so this is the first time that she's ever been to Gulfstream, and she took everything like a pro. And we broke, went to the front, and she won the race by a couple lengths. And then after that, I won a stake on her. So it's just um, it's it's you, you can feel how much you have under you but as well as how, how they carry themselves very classy and how educated they are, just, just how smart they are and how they carry themselves very classy. That's one of the main ways how you can tell a horse is um, pretty nice. So for a big day like the Pegasus down there in Florida, early in January, or late January, how fired up do you get on a, like a Pegasus day relative to just a regular day of racing? Um, For me, I... I I don't know. I feel like I, I every day when as soon as entries come out, I get the DRF. I study my races and I have my plan of what I'm going to do in the races. So it doesn't it. I feel like I, I give my 110 percent every single race, whether I'm 99 to one or I'm one to nine. I give my 100 percent, whether it's a grade two or it's a six thousand claimer of non two. That That's how I that's how I kind of take it, because. I'm competitive where no matter what race I ride in, I always want to win, no matter what it is. So that's one of the things that, um, it, but it's definitely a special feeling winning those type of races. Because I remember on New Year's Day when I won the stake, it's a it's a really nice feeling winning those races. But I just, uh, it's it's an adrenaline rush for us at the end of the day. When those gates open, it's not, you're not thinking about this is a grade two, this is a grade three, or it's a six two claimer. You're thinking, what can I do to win this race, if, if you get what I'm saying. No, yeah, I can. I mean, you're in it to win it, as the uh, saying goes, right? Yeah, absolutely. Sean? You, you brought up you brought up the odds when you get to the wire and you win on a thirty to one. Is it like an an excitement? And then when it's like when you're on a one to nine horse, is it one of those like like is there a difference like that? Um, I wouldn't I wouldn't think so because one thing that my my cousin and I have always really he he's really um pushed for me to learn is that when you ride races no matter if the horse is one to nine or 30 to one you have your strategy of how you want to ride the race and you make sure you put the horse in the best position possible to win the race and then if you put them in the best position possible whatever the horse does beyond there it's out of your control if you have enough horse to win the race you're going to win and if you don't then you just don't have enough horse you can only do so much as a jockey and just make sure your horse is in the position to win the race. That's that's the way I kind of take it. Whether it's one to nine or ninety nine to one, it's not being result oriented. It's just being you did you made sure you rode the right race and you rode the race properly, and you gave so, it hundred percent. So when you look at the DRF and you say looking at the race properly, are you looking at how the horse has won previously? So do you focus on the horse itself, or are you focused on the field in general? How, how do you look at the DRF that maybe handicappers might want to look at the DRF to give them a little better edge? Um, how I look at the DRF, it's what running style suits my horse, but at the same time, how the race is going to pan out. And the thing about um, how a race pans out is that sometimes you see the race with 10 speeds and you break and everybody's grabbing, so you end up in front. And sometimes you see a race with no speed and everybody else in the room read the, uh, looks at the race the same way. So when, when we, the gate opens, everybody's sending. So it's more based on how can you benefit off of that, that, that position, if you kind of get what I'm saying. You know, you can prepare yourself for scenario A, B, and C, and then scenario Z happens. You know, so it's really getting to know your horse and making sure that you know that, okay, in case there's a lot of speed in the race, everybody breaks and sends that my horse is okay to, to, to make a run from off of the pace for. If, if everybody breaks and grabs and there's not too much um, pace in the race, that my, my horse will be okay and won't be too keen in the front and will be able to settle and turn off. So um, a, lot of, a lot of racing I would and riding is just situational, but you can always be prepared by watching horses replay them, their tendencies and how they want. That, that's definitely a big help. So how much time do you have to make up your mind that, okay, this is going to be a faster than I expected or slower than I expected. You've got to then the first 16th, the first hundred yards. When do you think most races are won and lost? I would say it depends on the race too. Right. So I would say 
um, two turn races, I would say within the first hundred yards, the first 16th, you know, because, but it, it, it all varies at the same time because you can break and your plan is to go in front and somebody breaks and they send really hard. But as soon as they establish their stuff on the lead, they slow it down. And then that's when you have to say, okay, I'm not going to let him slow it down. I put a little pressure on him there or vice versa. You break and a lot of people send and you were, you were, um, anticipating to send so you take off of the pace and then you're just sitting behind everyone you know it's 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 really situation you just have to make that split second decision i feel and you have to one of the main things is knowing what your horse likes because not every horse is the same a lot of horses are so much different some horses don't like the kickback some horses get intimidated being inside of horses some horses they go in front and they put up their ears and they wait on other horses there's so much different variables with horses and that's one of the things when I mean by you have to know your horse and make sure you, you have your horse comfortable enough to run the best race possible. And how much do you pay attention to in-race body language from the horse? Like you say, you lift up his ears. So is that a point where you would say to yourself, okay, I got to give him one to refocus or how, how much attention do you pay to that? Well, I pay when I make, when I establish the lead on a horse and they put up their ears for me, that's a sign of a horse a horse putting up their ears is just a sign for me that the horse is very relaxed, turned off. So that's a good sign for me. But when we're turning for home is when you'll you'll say, okay, let's let's get to work now. But usually when they have their ears up is a, a good sign that you're going to have something in the tank for sure when, when, when you turn down the lane. I have one other question for you. You mentioned uh, before the whip, um, given the horse whip being foam. With HISA, these rules have all changed. Florida, I think, has not been one of the states that's kind of opted out. So do you find yourself saving the whip now more than you used to for the later part of the race? Like if you if you wanted to get your horse out in a hurry and it doesn't really respond, do you do, do you be are you a little more cautious giving him a crack to get going because you might need it in the lane? How is that impacting riding? So we're not allowed to actually take our hands off the reins and, and use the crop once we, before the three eighths full, we can have our hands on the reins and on the withers and like do a little tap and that will be okay. And we're allowed six strikes, meaning we can, we can take our hands off the reins and use the crop six times. And if not, you'll get fined and penalized. So we definitely have to um kind of wait and save, save the, the use of the crop and make sure that we don't use it out too much where, you're in a stretch battle and you've already used the, the crop uh, six times between the three-eighths pole and the eighth pole. And now you're at the eighth pole with the, to the wire and you're head and head with someone and you're not, you just can't use the crop. So it's, and then you got cracks and you don't, you know, you're done. <laughs> a little bit, you know, and sometimes some horses will just, you know, you show them the crop and they'll, they'll finish, you know? So it's, 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 it's a little difficult, but once you get used to it, cause we've had the six crop, the, the six strike rule in, in Florida, so a, a lot of us as riders in Florida, we've uh, we've adjusted to it, uh, adjusted to it a little while ago, back in November, when they really implemented that rule. That might give you guys an advantage when you travel. So, what's your strong point, coming off the pace or on the front? I think I saw before in an interview you said you prefer to be on the fast ones. Is that still the case? Yeah, I love being on. I, I love being in the front end because you, you, you're winning most of the race. So now you just have to, if you have enough horse. If you're dictating the pace the right way, where you go, uh, you're, you're a mile, you're going two turns where you're going a mile and you go 24, 48. If you have enough horse to finish up, or if your horse is comfortable in the front end and you have enough horse to finish up, um, you, you'll win the race, you know. But I just love winning, whichever way, whichever way my horse <laughs> likes to win. Yeah, <laughs> whatever sits in front of me. Yeah. Yeah, what kind of horse do you like to ride? The winning time. <laughs> yeah. But I love speed horses, I must say. I love speed horses. That brings up a good point, though, because rich pet peeve is when they're going way too fast in the beginning of the race. Not and then sprints, it, it's always in like a claiming 5,000 at parks that go out in the first quarter in a uh, in a mile long race of 21. And you even saw that with Latruska, with the, with the Ortiz brothers, when Latruska ran, when they went out too fast together. And I just I just wonder if I'm watching TV in Chicago and I know 21 is too fast. <laughs> How can the guy on the track riding a horse know that 21 is not too fast? Well, it's the, the, the difference between watching and um, watching a race and being like on, on the 
on the horse is just that, you know, we we try to anticipate what time that we're going in our heads, but we, we, we don't know until we see, until we watch the replays after. And also a lot of times when you have a plan and you establish yourself in front and then you just have another horse push you along, sometimes you, you're already, you, you have your position established, so you can't take a hold of that horse. So it's like you have to keep going unless you're going to lose your position in the race. You know, there's just a, a lot of variables. And sometimes, I, like I said, racing is very situational, you know. Us as jockeys, we can always go back and find stuff in our in our replays and really fine-tune our riding. But it's just, you, you know, sometimes when you break and you establish the lead and then you're an eighth of a mile into the race or a quarter of a mile, and then you get pressed and then the second quarter is faster than the first. And, you know, you go 22 for the second quarter after you went 24 for the first quarter. You know, there's nothing – you can't really do too much about it sometimes because if you take a hold, you'll lose your position. You'll get shuffled back as well. You know what I'm saying? So it's it's a lot of variables. And yeah, then, I, you know, I've seen them when they get out like 10, 10, 10 lengths on the, 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 on the field. And I think to myself, okay, what's wrong with five? What's wrong with four? You're still far enough ahead and saving a second or two, and it could be enough. So Terry asks, I think I know the answer to this question. Is there an exception for safety using the crop if your horse is bearing out, for instance? So we, so when we talked to Mike Smith, Mike Smith said, and I'm sure you agree with him on this because you've been on so many horses, you know before the horse knows that it's going to bolt, right? Mm -hmm. So if that's the case, do you, given a situation, so you're on a horse and you see maybe it's ears going like this, his head starts to turn and you know, okay, he's about to go. Yes. So you're at six already. Do you give him one and say, screw it, and then go you know, deal with the uh, stewards afterwards? It, what kind of leeway do they give to you, the jockey, on situations like that that might not be obvious to the eye, but you know on the horse, if I don't do something, something's going to happen? I feel like um, with our stewards, if we explain it like that, where I've I've gone over the six strikes before because um, I was just getting used to the rule and I wanted to win a race. Like I said, and I was in a stretch battle and I hit one more time more than I should have. And I said to the, to the stewards, I said, you know, I, I really – I really lost track. I wanted to win the race. And where we have that mutual respect for the stewards now where we can say that, okay, this horse was actually going to try and get out. This horse was going to prop or do something. And Mike Smith was 100% spot on where he said, you as a rider can feel something happening before it happened, before the horse does it, because they'll put their ears up and you'll feel them start putting on the brakes. And it's not visible, visible to – you know, the, the, the clear eye on TV or, you know, whichever view you're watching it from, it's not too visible. But you as a rider, you can feel them where they put their ears up and they, they, they kind of start jamming their feet because they're going to prop or do something. So it's, it's, it's something, especially a lot of riders and a lot of stewards that, are, that used to ride, they know that, you know, you can feel it happen before it actually does happen. So... To go back a little bit too, you're saying there's a difference between me sitting on the couch watching and you guys out there. That's just cute. Slight difference. Just, Slight difference. <laughs> so, some people don't think there is, you know. <laughs> also, you know, another pet peeve of mine. I agree with Rich, but another pet peeve of mine when somebody does have a speed horse, they keep them actually too close to the pace, where the horse on the outside is pressuring them. And I never understand if you have the speed with the horse, why don't you get away from that horse in second? You know what I mean? Because some horses don't like being pressured at all. Um, but certain jockeys that aren't very good at speed seem to do that. Well, it just depends as well, too. You know, um, you mean if you're getting pressured like head and head? I yeah. Feel like sometimes you can try to get away, but especially if you're on a favorite, the rider next to you will make sure that he keeps that pressure so you don't win the race. So it's it's not only the rider on the front. You know, sometimes because I've had that happen to me where I'm on a speed horse. And I got pressured where I'm the favorite, where they try to um, kind of make sure my horse gets tired. And sometimes I do have more horse where I could go on. And, you know, when it's time to get going, that horse ends up running out of energy, burning out a little bit. And my horse ends up going on and winning. But a lot of times, if they know that you're the favorite or you're one of the choices, they're going to keep that pressure on you to make sure that you don't win the race. You know, it's, it's a part of race riding. Keep you honest, so to speak. Yeah. So is there really a target always out for the first couple of favorites while you're out there? Um, it just depends on the race. You know, if, if I have a favorite down inside of me, I'm not going to come off and make an early move to let him come out. You know what I'm saying? But it's not like I'm going to try and, 
focus my whole race on sabotaging his race because you know as we know sometimes you look at a horse on paper that it, it looks hard to beat but when you look they finished last because you know maybe the horse wasn't having a good day or you know something might have happened you know so you can't base my race i can't base my my race as a rider or solely around another horse you know what i'm saying you can try your best to make sure that you can take away something from that horse's race in in a clean manner i'm not saying in a dirty manner but where they could press pressure that horse or keep that horse into a spot where he he can't get out of trouble that type of thing but you don't want to base your race around the, another horse's race i would say hmm. i have one question for you one last question from me you guys are loading in and there's one horse that doesn't want to go in and they keep circling it and circling it and trying to get it in. I wonder sometimes, so let's say, you know, you want to get off to a fast start and you know, maybe there's a couple horses in there a little quicker than you are. And you figure if I let them settle in there a little bit, I might have a chance to maybe dull their coming out of the gates. Do you guys sometimes go a little bit extra longer on those circles before you get them up? Let's go get them in here so that you can make the other ones wait a little bit longer. No, we, we try to, um, it's all kind of a safety thing because we know that um, people, the horses that are already in the gate, you know, especially two-year-olds, they get very antsy in the gate. And we know that sometimes if they hear something behind the gate, they'll, they'll, they'll get a little timid and get a little scared. So if I'm on, if I'm the guy on the horse behind the gate, I want to, if you're the last one in, tendencies are when you're the last one in, a lot of times your horse usually tends to break faster anyways. But if you're sitting inside of the gate waiting, you, you know, you kind of have an eye out of when the other horse is loading and so you know that you're going to break and you want to try to keep your horse's attention so your horse can break as quick as possible as well when you are that guy do you feel like pressure like come on man get in there like you know when you're <laughs> late for traffic or something yeah you, you try to you, you try to make your horse get in the gate because you know you don't want something to happen to any any one of the other riders where the horse gets a little timid or you know something just happens because you also have the starter that's holding them in there you always want to make sure that at the end of the day for us as jockeys um, I think the, the main thing is that we all go home safe to our families because we all have a family. We, we all have a life and every, a lot of the other jockeys, I don't have kids, but I know some of the, most of the other riders do, you know, so that's the main thing that we all go home safe at the end of the day. Mm, for sure. We agree with that, Sean. Any final thoughts, Sean? I have two more questions. So what's your long-term goal? Is it to ride at Golfstream or you got other tracks on the map? Uh, yeah, definitely. So to definitely expand out after, you know, after I get my business, um, you, you know, after honestly, business is starting to pick up the last couple of weeks. So I just want to get rolling. And whenever is the right time to step away from golf and go to a bigger circuit or something where I could get better horses or whenever I get a, a nice um, decent offer from a nice agent where I can pick up business elsewhere, you know, and definitely pick up my business where I can be riding a lot more bigger races and you know the, the the classic races in the future because that's where as a jockey you want to ride in the derbies the breeders cups those type of races and then my last one is talk about your fan tech and all the merchandise people can buy um we have a lot of merchandise at fan tech and i must say that i'm so happy for cameron because i remember uh when he just called me with the idea of just launching it i was i think i was the first jockey to be on board there so i'm just really happy for what he's doing for the sport I think it's something great to give fans something and something to root for. You know, if you wear a uh, Romero Mirage jersey into Publix or into a, a subway, wherever, and somebody asks, who's that? You know, you tell them Romero Mirage, he's a jockey. They'll probably go down to the track, check out horse racing, you know, something like that. So I really, I, I really like what he's doing for the sport. And I told him I, I love my design, the Miami Vice, you know, because I'm, my, Miami, Florida, it's home for me. And I, I love it here. I, I can talk about Florida all day. Do you, get a lot of, do you get a lot of fan experiences in between races and stuff? Uh, yeah, sometimes the, the little kids, you know, they'll come up, ask me for goggles, a uh, little, uh, a nice picture, d different stuff like that. So something I actually learned from Tyler Connor, and maybe you can explain this a little bit better. Um, I was at Penn National the night I met Tyler Connor, and all these kids were asking for goggles. And jockeys would always give the goggles, but when it was a turf race, they would not give the goggles. And he explained to me how they're so much more expensive. Can you explain that a little bit for the average fan that don't know that? Oh, if it's a turf goggle. Well, I use dirt goggles on the turf. Oh. I used to use turf goggles when I was a bug boy. I don't know. I, I, I like having the same goggles every race now. I don't know why. But the turf goggles are, are like four times the amount as a regular goggle. I think that's why. 
Are they four what's times the better? Yeah, what's the difference? <laughs> um, just the material. Just the material. It's um, I think it's more of a, a a glass type of thing. Not not glass, but maybe like acrylic type of thing. It's a plastic and acrylic, but it's it's like four times the price. Maybe that's why. Mm, yeah. Well, then you can only give away one instead of four. Okay. One last question from Robert Bryan. How important is the warm up? Meaning, I see some jockeys really warming up and some not so much. Is that again horse dependent? Um. Yeah, it is horse dependent because I myself, every horse that I can take away from the pony and just get to know them before the race, get to warm them up. Um, I, I like to do that because especially if I haven't ridden the horse before, I like to get them to relax before the race, have a nice warm up, even if it's just a little gallop, a little jogging, stretch your legs and make sure they're comfortable with me as a rider, get to know me as well, you know, make sure they're in their comfort zone and run the run their best race possible. That that's why I like taking horse away from the pony. But some horses you just can't take away from the pony because they're because they're really strong. They they just want to go. And some horses they they might get a little bit timid and look at different things when they're away from the pony. So that's why I may not take other horses away from the pony as well. But for the most part, I love going away from the pony, getting to know my horse, getting them comfortable and to relax before the race. So they can win. Your favorite thing to do. So if folks want to keep up with you, Romero, what's the best way to keep up with you? Is it TikTok with the dances and the music? Oh, no, I don't We're not that. dancing, mostly horse races. <laughs> is it Twitter, the jockey experience? Where do you want folks to follow you? Um, I would love for them to follow my personal account on Twitter, Romero NLSA. And I would love even more if they follow the jockey experience, which is uh, a project that we, 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 I think we can change or not change, but racing a lot. That's one of the things that we're, our mission is in, in the jockey experience to help racing and just bridge that gap and bring new technology into racing. Fantastic. We'll link to both of them in the recap of the show so you can keep up with Romero. Thank you for joining us tonight. Pleasure's been ours, and uh, we hope to see you in the winter circle a lot. Whether they're fast horses, slow horses, it don't matter. <laughs> Thank you so much. It was a pleasure. It's our pleasure. Thanks. Have a great evening. You too. Yeah. There's the big head. Sean, again, I'm <laughs> getting excellent at this big head thing. Always fun. Uh, great guests. Everybody in this business is really remarkably friendly, I, and I appreciate that. Yeah, absolutely. And, and you know, the same, we were talking about the track too. I mean, 95% of them make time for everybody at the track too, especially the kids. Well, maybe with Romero being down in Florida and we've been trying to get Brady on, maybe, maybe he can help <laughs> us out with that. <laughs> for the, for the yeah, I don't show, know about that. Kentucky Derby. Thank you, Robert. We appreciate it. It's always the guest that makes the great interview. And that's the, uh, that's, that's the point of the show to introduce everybody, like Romero says, to the sport, the positive side of the sport. Yeah. And get enough negativity, just turn on the TV and you'll need Prozac. I think that's my theory on why so many people are on Prozac because they watch the evening news. But go. if you watched earlier yesterday for Glorious Goodwood, you would have found Tom picked a nice $491 trifecta. We'll see if he can do it again. Tom and I lined up a little bit earlier today on YouTube Ubiquitous again, where we did the Glorious Goodwood for tomorrow. Maybe I'll get the $500 trifecta tomorrow. If you haven't checked out the show for tomorrow, you can find it right here on Horse Racing Radar TV. Sean, what should they do to make sure they don't miss anything we do? Uh, Facebook, Twitter, um, Instagram, at Horse Race, the number two day. And then, like you said, subscribe to that YouTube channel. Um, you get to see Rich three times a day this week. Um, besides Why would anybody want to do that? <laughs> <laughs> um, so what time are those races at England? The first one I think is like 9:30 in the morning Eastern time. Okay. The second one's at 10. There's a full card, and I will I will be putting so, up the recap, and you can see them all on uh, HorseRacingToday.net a little bit later on. So another morning where you can start right off with horse racing, go into the afternoon where you got horse racing. Stop, watch Rich. Well, Terry's back tomorrow too, right? Rich yes, and Terry tomorrow. I, I'm so grateful <laughs> not to be flying solo anymore, Sean. I'll tell you that. My back hurts, sure. Terry. You're gonna have a lot of lifting to do tomorrow. <laughs> So either you're going to forget that Terry's there and do all the talking, or you're going to be like, Terry, it's all yours. Whether Terry's there or not, I do all the talking. (laughs) (laughs) It's what what would make any show different from the next one. It just gives me a second to press a couple buttons in the background (laughs) and not look completely foolish. That's all. There you go. All right, Sean. So let's talk a little bit about Kentucky before we move on to Hissa. Seems like whatever they're doing in the state of Kentucky, it's working for horse racing because yet again, there is a new track, and there's an, another one coming after this. So construction of a new horse racing facility in Boyd County expected to begin later this year. 
Um, this looks, and they're also going to put together a big quarter horse, like a $500 yeah. million dollar quarter horse facility. So what are they doing in Kentucky that the rest of these horse racing states can't get right? Uh, and you know, it's just, I mean, when you think horse racing, what's the first thing you think of? Kentucky, right? Mm -hmm. So, and I, I mean, I, I think the first thing I think is getting beat at the losing every photo, but after that, I think yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, and I have a, you know, I have a boss at work that will tell me, you know, he visited kentucky and just these horses and they're like what do they do different here and it's just the grass it's how they work out it's oh it's the you know, good grass now <laughs> <laughs> you know it's it's how they work out it's you know everything so um as far as putting these tracks together you know i guess it's just you know the market's there obviously it's been you know horse racing heaven basically so mm -hmm. um it's different though with the quarter horses but uh that'll be nice i mean hey anything Adding tracks and creating more revenue, the better, right? Uh, I mean, whatever. I'm just saying, if you're if you're, if you're a horse racing state, you know, there's the old saying that you know, if you want to do what successful people do, emulate what they're doing. So, if you're a state that's out there that's actually interested in supporting horse racing, why not invite in some people from Kentucky, find out what they're doing, and follow that model, right? There's no just <laughs> yeah. build the same mousetrap, right? The right. Mousetrap works. Mm -hmm. You don't need to build a different one. All right. So the other day we had on uh, Keith Austin, right, Keith? Yep. Yep. Yes. Yep. I, I was unsure in my old adult brain if it was Keith or Kevin. So I'm thankful I got right. <laughs> one of the 50 50 guesses. So you got, got it. Right. Yeah. Yes, yeah. Indeed. yeah. But he had mentioned how happy he was to live in the state of Louisiana where they were, you know, challenging some of the parts of this HISA law. And right now a federal judge has come back and said, hey, HISA. You got to sit back and wait in Louisiana and West Virginia. Interesting that Texas is not listed here, but seeing how they were one of the pioneers of the anti hissa movement. But it does look like this is going to go to court and they're going to test some of the constitutionality of this. That could be interesting, Sean. Yeah, now I would expect, wouldn't you expect more states to try to follow this too? Um, well, I would think that yeah. Texas and all of those would probably file those like I don't know what they call them. I'm not a lawyer, but like an amicus brief or something like that, where they're in support of the ongoing. Uh, I don't have all the lawyers out there that I just completely got wrong. I'm not a lawyer. <laughs> just trying to pretend is like it, I'm one on YouTube. Yeah. Isn't it like a stay or something like that? I, I don't know. No, the stay um, is like, I know that it's like when the judge says, okay, you got to stop what you're doing. Yeah. Right? yeah so yeah. you can no longer. Yeah. So what happens like if there's a, a, is a case that's gone to court and other people kind of like want to tag on, as like a part of the uh, the people who are suing, what is it? What is that? the plaintiff and uh, what's the other one? I don't know. The, I don't want plaintiff. The plaint plaintiff and defendant. Yeah. Okay. There you go. The plaintiff and the defendant. So I guess the <laughs> yeah. defendant in this case is the U.S. government. So if they want to join one side or the other and you know and kind of add to the logic, they can do that. So I, I wouldn't be surprised to see Texas and the other states that are, you know. Yeah. Yeah. You know, they're join. probably mad. They didn't. They probably mad. They didn't start from the beginning on that. Um, you know, it was. It's good that they fought. Not many people probably thought they were going to win, but hey, power in numbers again, and they did the right thing. And they, for now, they have a little victory. Um, so we'll see what comes of it from there, um, and how many more states go to it. And speaking of Keith Austin, he texted me the other day. Since he's been on the show, he's won two more in a row, so he's won three in a row now. So um, was TVG we, bought out? No, what happened with TVG? We talked about this a little bit yesterday. Is they are owned by FanDuel. And I learned from Tom today, I did not know this, what TVG stands for. Do you know what the G is for, Sean? Uh, the, 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 it, you don't know. It's games. <laughs> yeah, television games. Uh -huh. well, well, how come you didn't say right. games then? I was thinking, I was trying to get the TV first, and uh, yeah, it's television games. Yes, because I guess originally it was slated to be for sports, and now they went to horse racing. So now they're going to go to ESPN Ocho, like in the movie Dodgeball. So that's going to be <laughs> awesome. I don't, I don't know, you know how that channel survives um, when they have it, um, but uh, yes. yeah, I don't know. I can't wait for Todd Shrupp to be announcing pickleball, <laughs> which well, apparently you know, is wiffle ball with a tennis racket. Okay, is that what it is? I mean, I've heard it a million times. I just never, never even thought. You know, some things you like hear and you're like, what is that? And I really want to Google it. Pickleball, I didn't even take the time and effort to go, what the heck is pickleball and look it up. Uh, but on Todd Shrupp's, you know, Todd Shrupp probably could announce anything or talk about anything and make it sound exciting. So I'm sure he'll be able to do it. I don't know if he's going to enjoy it as much, but. Yes, I think he probably will enjoy it just as much. 
the uh, could just think all the fun you can have with pickles and butter. <laughs> <laughs> that would be interesting. <laughs> All right, Sean. So one final thing. Speaking of which, I do have an idea. And if there's any investors out there that are interested in hearing this idea, uh, please go ahead and email me at gtsrichb at gmail.com or hit up Sean or myself on the DM on Twitter. That's Horse Race Today down there for Twitter for Sean. And I'm HRT Rich. I got an idea there that we might do some very good business on. So they might kill horse racing. They might kill horse racing because they said they're going to do tertiary sports on TVG. And they mentioned Korean football. I did not know that the Koreans played football. I thought that was a Canadian-American thing. And then uh, they talked about Chinese basketball and pickleball. <laughs> I still get a kick out of that, pickleball. All right. But I know of about 64 people, Sean, who are going to be happy to hear that Hissa is in, uh, in court in Louisiana and West Virginia. <laughs> 64 riding crop violations since the implementation. That just was what, like 20 days ago. That's like three people a day. And yeah, this story but is a couple days old. Don't you think, uh, maybe I'm the only one, I would have actually thought there would be more. I mean, I thought this was going to be every race card. You know, there was going to be at least one jockey that hit there's him. One, too there's one that you see like he just doesn't care because he's been, he's like every track he's go to, he's got a violation. <laughs> yeah, yeah. He, he's more. He's worried more about winning than uh, getting the fines. But, yeah, I mean, 64 is a lot, but I honestly thought he'd be really I gotta, high. I, I, I mean, I don't know. You know, Ty Kennedy would know he's in the jockey community. Romero and all the people that we've talked to that are in the jockey community. I got to think 64 in 20 days is probably high. Yeah, but what you what did you expect? I mean, so that's if that's 20 days, that's three a day. I mean, sometimes you have, well, we know you have 20, 25 tracks a day. So, yeah, you know. It still seems to me to be a high number because you figure, you do the math on that. That's like, what is that, three a day? That's 1000 a year. And these fines are 250 bucks the first time, like 500 oh, bucks a second oh. versus forfeited. I mean, at the end of the year, I mean, you're talking about, you're talking about destruction of jockeys, of barns, of trainers. I mean, think about if you're a small barn, you get 10 of these fines, you know, a, a year. Oh, yeah. I mean, you're talking yeah, about I, really I, I wanna, in the profit margins. I want to be on the side of everybody who's getting that money, um, which I guess well, it's going it's to watch to Hissa. House, yeah. Right? Yeah. yeah. House always wins, Sean. <laughs> yeah. That's what Hissa stand for. The house always wins. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, that brings us wire to wire on this Tuesday, Sean, tomorrow night, we will have another guest. Who is that going to be? Yeah, we'll have newest member of 6,000 Wind Club for Jockey, uh, Deshaun Parker. Oh, I can't so. wait for that. That'll be a fun interview as well. Deshaun seems like a person with a lot of personality, so that show should be interesting. And then tomorrow, Terry returns. Like I said, my back hurts from carrying the weight the last week, so I'm looking forward to Terry coming back, helping me out. Um, it's going to be a, I, I can't wait for that. We're going to do Saratoga tomorrow. We'll do Del Mar on Thursday. Tom and I will be back tomorrow again at 6 p.m. for day three of the glorious Goodwood. Again on Thursday. I don't know. Do we have a guest yet for Thursday night show? We do not. I'm, I'm reached out to a couple of people. No guest yet. Yeah. Well, I'm sure you'll be able to secure one before long. And then, of course, Eddie C. <laughs> and Chris P. <laughs> will be back to do their spot plays on Saturday. we got a lot of things cooking. And next week, I will be out. But we're going to have a much better looking host in Jamie Martinez, and she'll take over the reins every other week. So I think that'll be good. We want to introduce new people to the uh, sport and bring more people into our community. So hopefully I know Jamie's going to do a phenomenal job. She's definitely got a lot of personality as well, and she's connected into the business. So I think her perspective will be fantastic addition to this show, Sean. Yeah, and then uh, that week we have a great schedule too. We have jockey Alex Cruz from Emerald Downs. Um, Tuesday we have Tuesday the second we have Andy Bia Cohen from TVG, and her father's a trainer. So now before she's doing pickle pickleball. <laughs> <laughs> and Wednesday, August third, we have jockey Scott Spieth. It's going to be a fantastic week. Uh, see what happens when I'm gone. You get all the good stuff. All no, right, we so always I'm, get good guests. Yes, no matter do. who's on. You do a phenomenal job at that. I just. Just kidding, of course. Self-deprecate. <laughs> and 
I'll also yeah, say I almost used the other word. <laughs> Jamie did a great job of scheduling all of August. I scheduled all Alex Cruz on the first before we knew that she took care of the rest of her weeks in August. So she's doing a great job scheduling guests as well. Yeah, I'm sure the shows are going to be phenomenal. I'm looking forward to watching them. All right. Until we get back tomorrow, Sean, no matter what it is you're doing the rest of this evening, uh, before we get back tomorrow again, Terry and I, again, looking forward to that, doing Saratoga. We hope that no matter what you do, it ends up in J. Marco's Winner Circle. Absolutely. Have a fantastic Tuesday. Thanks for joining us tonight. Mm -hmm.